Hi guys, today I'm back with another step-by-step uh, -step arcade PCB repair. Um, I got some spare time and uh, the tools I <laughs> accumulated over time for PCB repair are getting dusty, so I figured I'd uh, just make another video. Um, today we're going to look at uh, this PCB over here, which is a Combo Tribes PCB, which is a beat'em up game made by Technos in 1990. And um, I actually got this off of eBay. Um, it was sold as non-working. It has some graphical issues. The game is actually running and the sound is supposed to work. But uh, as you can see here on the pictures in the auction, um, there's um, uh, in the graphics, which are recognizable, there's uh, obviously some white lines. Uh, for every second line, which are obstructing uh, the view on the gameplay, so to say. Yes, and um, well, today uh, we are going to... The board just arrived today, so uh, we are going to take a look at it and uh, we'll try to get it working again. Okay, I hooked the board up to my test setup over here and uh, so let's fire it up and take a look. Okay, so just as uh, seen in the auction, uh, there are obviously white lines, but the game is running, obviously, and you can hear the sound. Let's check if we can actually even play the game. Okay. Well, looks looks good. Seems to work. Take this. <laughs> okay. So that's nice. It's everything um, as described. Seems to be working. So let's get to the troubleshooting. Okay. So where do we start uh, our troubleshooting? Uh, well, one problem with this repair, unfortunately, is uh, that there's no um, schematics available for this um, board on the web. It is not uh, impossible to repair um, a PCB if you don't have the schematics, but um, um, actually the schematics make everything uh, much easier and um, make the repair probably more um, quick. Um, but um, if you want to, you can actually always, um, practically by looking at the board, um, reconstruct uh, the schematics that are behind it, e either by uh, looking at the parts and following the traces on the board, or by doing continuity tests. You could uh, pra practically um, make uh, your own schematics for an, uh, for an unknown board. This, of course, takes time, so uh, we are not going to make a complete set of uh, schemat schematics for the combat tribe sport uh, for the purpose of the repair. Uh, so we have to uh, uh, approach the problem in a different way, uh, I'm afraid. So I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to start at a known point. And uh, if we are, because we are dealing with a video issue, we could actually start at the RGB outputs of the PCB. Because we know that where they are, because it's a JAMA board and uh, it uses the JAMA standard. So I think actually pins 12 and 13 on the part side are the red and blue color component. We could actually trace where those are coming from on the board. Most of the time they will be coming from resistor networks, which are used on many arcade games to convert digital RGB data into analog data, which is required for the uh, connection to the monitor. Before the resistor networks there will probably be some sort of buffers um, connected. Before the buffers there will probably be some pallet ramps. And before the pallet ramps, there will maybe be some kind of RAM which contains the current uh, screen data, and that could be uh, the spot where we have to uh, where we have to go. So let's start 
just uh, by looking at the RGB output uh, uh, on the board, uh, for instance, uh, with an oscilloscope. Okay, so the red and blue um, video signal are coming from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13, those two. And if you follow the traces on the PCB, you will be getting, sure enough, to those um, uh, three re resistor networks here. And um, as I already said, they are doing the digital to analog conversion. Um, and this is, by the way, this is red, green and blue. Um, you can just follow the traces and see that uh, those uh, resistor networks are for the different colors. I just uh, hooked up the oscilloscope to the um, blue resistor network and uh, looked at the signal. And what do we see? Uh, we actually see what we are also seeing on the screen. And that is um, that we are having an altering a white line, which is this um, segment here, where the signal is high all the time, followed by a mixed analog signal, which is re representing the um, colors, or the color blue, uh, for a particular line on the screen. And after that, it's switching to a, a white line again. And if we uh, measure that, um, we can see that the two lines, one white line and one with color, uh, if we are measuring here with the cursor, do result in a frequency of uh, 7.8 kilohertz. That is um, exactly the uh, half of the uh, line frequency of 15.6 uh, that we are used to from the regular uh, low-res arcade monitors. So that makes uh, perfect sense. Okay, so if we uh, continue to follow uh, the traces, I actually just did this using my continuity tester because it's uh, very difficult on this board um, to follow the traces. Uh, we can actually see that um, the outputs which are going to those three resistor networks are generated from those two ICs. And those ICs are actually buffers. Um, like in most um, arcade games, it's also the case with this game that um, the resistor networks are fed by some buffers which are deactivated on a vertical retrace of a screen and um, obviously and um, which are otherwise um, outputting data that is sent to them from the pallet RAMs. And uh, the pallet RAMs um, are actually those two guys over here. Uh, the longer uh, ICs with the uh, 24 legs. Those two are connected to these. So um, we already know a bit about the circuit. Uh, so these are the buffers. This is, uh, this is the resist resistor networks. And this is the, um, appear to be the pallet RAMs. So can uh, the failure of the resistor networks, the buffers or the pallet ramps be causing the issue? No, probably not, because um, the pallet is okay. We're seeing the picture. It's not a pallet issue. It is the graphical data that is sent to the pallet chips that must be the problem. So we have to trace uh, further back from the pallet chips. We have to check where they get the, uh, the input from uh, to figure out where the problem actually lies. Um, the output of the pallet ramps is coming through their data lines, of course. And um, the input, which uh, corresponds to the um, color of the pixels on the screen, has to go to them through the address lines, because the address lines are selecting the entry, so, or the item, so to speak, from the pallet. So we have to check the address lines of these RAMs and see where they are hook, hooked up to. They will probably be hooked up to the CPU because the CPU will at some point need to be able to fill the pallet RAM with a valid pallet. Um, otherwise uh, this uh, thing won't work. These aren't EEPROMs or anything. These are RAMs, so they have to be programmed by the CPU. 
but also they need to be connected on the address lines to the source of the graphical data. That is uh, the way uh, we are going. Okay, so by uh, further uh, fiddling around with my uh, multimeter um, over here, which uh, I set on continuity, um, I could uh, figure out that these um, pallet ramps are connected to these TTL chips over here, which are, um, no, excuse me, uh, those TTL chips over here, which are all the same type, LS157, which are um, quad input multiplexers. So, um, what that means is that there is four inputs coming uh, into these chips, and uh, the chi those chips select between the four inputs, they are selecting one to forward to the um, to the pallet RAM and um, this is actually pretty familiar because this is how it uh, actually worked on the original Double Dragon um, we had this in previous Double Dragon uh, repair videos that I did the graphic on the screen actually contains of several layers the background layer, the objects uh, on the screen which are players and opponents and also text overlays on the screen and um, you can think of it as um, independent circuits on the board which are producing uh, the graphics for the background and for the overlays and for the opponents independent from one another and um, at the end all data is uh, brought together and for each pixel of course only one thing can be displayed on the screen so there has to be a decision uh, has to be made uh, which uh, layer goes on top of what other layer and this is actually what those uh, guys are doing here they are selecting which of the inputs which of the f uh, three inputs actually graphical inputs um, will be sent through for a specific pixel on the screen to the um, palette ramps to be decoded into RGB values sent through the buffers sent th uh, through the resistor networks to be converted to analog RGB values. Okay guys, I had to show you um, again this. this uh, these are my uh, beloved uh, Double Dragon schematics uh, and I'm uh, showing them uh, again to you because uh, of the striking similarities to the uh, Combo Tribes board. Um, we do have the RGB outputs here. We do have the resistor networks. We do have the two buffer chips. Uh, which are a 273 and a 174, which are exactly the same on the Combo Tribes board. We do have the RAM chips, which are almost the same. They used, um, on Double Dragon, they used one smaller, uh, one bigger uh, RAM chip with eight da data lines and one smaller RAM chip with four data lines because uh, the RGB values only have 12 data lines total that is the same with this board but they uh, used two of the bigger ones nevertheless i get i guess those became uh, obsolete in between uh, just outdated but uh, really interestingly uh, you can see down here ls uh, 153 there are five of these and these are selecting the layers uh, which are um, background objects and text overlay um, layers it's all the same uh, on the uh, Combo Tribes board like it is on the Double Dragon. So the five, uh, uh, one, five, three chips are the ones that I've shown you here. This are those five here. So very, very, very similar architecture so far. Okay, so what does that help us? Where is, uh, are we getting at? Uh, well, it's quite easy actually. Um, if we uh, remember how uh, the Double Dragon board selected um, the layer it wanted to um, show on the screen for a particular uh, pixel, um, we remember that it was using a, a bipolar prompt chip uh, which is on the board and uh, which uses as inputs part of the uh, incoming data lines from all the different layers and based on this um, data it gets from uh, the uh, 
different layers, it somehow decides through an internal table, so to speak, uh, which layer it will uh, show uh, topmost on the screen. So to be uh, more uh, specific, for instance, if you have a location on the screen where you have a text overlay, uh, like the score of the player or the amount of continues, you will probably want to display it in front of the background and also if there are any objects in that area you will also uh, not you will not want to display them but you will display the um, text overlays uh, which go uh, uh, before everything uh, else so this is the uh, job of this uh, prompt chip on the double dragon board to prioritize um, which layer to show and uh, this chip decides uh, which uh, graphical data will go through to the palette RAMs and it will do the switching of the multiplexers. And um, sure enough, uh, the next thing I was looking for on this board was a prompt chip. And uh, I actually found one. It is right here. And guess what? Uh, the signal lines uh, A and B, which are the input selectors for these multiplexers, are coming uh, here from lines uh, 10 and 11 on this chip. Okay, and the good thing about that is we can remove this chip because it is socketed and we can then manually select which layer of the graphics we want to look at. So we can actually look at only the background, only the uh, objects and only the text overlays uh, on the screen by uh, manually pulling signals uh, low and high on these pins um, 11 and 12. And what is the point of that? Well, of course, we want to find out, uh, we are still um, uh, wanting to find out where our white lines are coming from. And I, uh, I think they are most likely um, coming from um, one of the three layers Maybe they are on the background, maybe they are with the objects, maybe they are with the text overlays. We can't tell at the moment. Somehow they seem to be have a very high priority for the uh, prompt chip to be displayed so that other graphical data that might be there is overwritten. That's at least my guess, but we can verify that um, uh, if we remove the prompt chip uh, from the socket and take a look at the screen and um, manually alter the signal uh, on the lines that are controlling the multiplexers. Well, okay, so here's the game and if I now, haha, <laughs> if I now remove the chip, the prompt chip from the socket, guess what? we see the street and uh, well we don't see any characters and we don't see any text overlays or anything the street is moving a bit because they're probably fighting but what's uh, the interesting point is that the street looks all right there's no uh, white lines in the graphics so the background graphics layer actually seems to be okay well, you can probably see it here. This picture was looking perfectly like this. But there's just, you know, just the Combo Tribes logo missing because the other, other uh, layers aren't there. Okay, so let's uh, just look at the next layer. Okay, I now manually pulled uh, one of the signals low. And what we're now seeing is well, actually another part of the background um, on the other channel, so to speak, we saw uh, the street and here we have the houses. Um, this um, background appears to be uh, animated in contrast to the background uh, of the street, which uh, wasn't animated. Oh, the Techno's logo looks fine. So this might be the difference between uh, those two uh, layers, that the one is with animation and one is without animation. But again, 
graphics look nice and uh, uh, clear and there's no white lines. So let's look at the third layer. Okay, so this is the third layer and um, well the black lines are uh, the white lines are back and uh, but what else can we see on the screen? Well the characters obviously we could just saw the text overlays on top of the screen but no well this uh, also uh, seems to fall among uh, character graphics but other than that uh, there's nothing on the screen here no background on top no street uh, on the bottom so that is the characters layer and so what we can say now is that the problem is actually with the data coming from this characters layer so uh, we the next thing to do would actually trace further back from the multiplexers uh, the channel where it receives uh, the data for the objects and check uh, where this data um, is coming from and try to find out uh, why every second line uh, appears to have a problem but just before we continue, um, I just remembered something from a from previous uh, video I um, actually released um, about a, a double dragon repair and that was the uh, double dragon uh, repair board number two video uh, that actually had a similar fault on the um, well, I can't see it so well on the, um, on the screen here. This is actually my uh, other video which I just paused here the uh, background graphics seems to be uh, seem to be okay. Uh, the text overlays too, but um, the characters seem to be missing every second line. The only difference between this uh, uh, error and the error we are having with the combo types is that um, the missing lines in this case were transparent, uh, whereas uh, in the case of the combo types they are white. So, but that's really the only difference and. Um, so I'm pretty confident that it's kind of the same error with the double dragon. It turned out to be a RAM issue. And uh, well, let, let me look again at the um, description, um, uh, at the uh, schematics for the double dragon board. Um, and let's look at the spot that we found uh, at uh, with the last repair. Okay, I guess uh, last time we the problem was lying. Uh, uh, with those two RAM chips. We had discovered uh, in the other video that there's some sort of a dual architecture uh, going on in the circuitry, so everything exists uh, twice. And the reason for that was because um, uh, they were toggling between the lines, um, between uh, the two uh, pathways. So one of the pathways was um, activated uh, via a um, via the V1 signal which came in here and the other other one was activated via the uh, negative V1 signal so they were toggling and um, altering um, and uh, yeah it turned out that one of the two RAM chips um, uh, was bad so every second line was basically not being displayed correctly like we uh, have it now so um, we might actually um, try to find so we could either I'd say we could either um, trace uh, further onward from our uh, layer selector multiplexers um, to check where the data is coming from or we could uh, alternatively we could maybe if it is pr a problem with the object layers uh, at the moment also and it's a very similar problem that we had before with the, this other Technos PCB, we could also um, maybe try to look for two RAM chips which might be um, um, located or situated in a similar fashion uh, like here, uh, circuit-wise, and uh, we could maybe try to identify them via their uh, write signal, because uh, it will probably be the case that while one of the chips is written, the other one is read. And while the other one is written, uh, this one is being read. So they will be toggling. They won't never be, they will never be written at the same time. Um, 
and uh, they will be most likely toggling with a frequency of 15 kilohertz with their right signal. So they should be actually, if they exist on the combat tribes board, they should be actually be uh, identifiable with this criteria. Okay, by probing around on the board, I actually found two RAM chips which are not even next to each other but they are sort of um, situated around this uh, custom IC and uh, they are also next to these uh, EEPROM banks which might contain the graphical data for the objects uh, because this is the biggest EEPROM bank and the graphical objects um, always uh, seem to take up with all the characters and all the phases of animation take uh, t tend to take up the most uh, space so that would make uh, some sense and um, uh, what I did is I hooked up the two uh, right enable lines to my scope uh, and this is uh, what we can see on the scope interestingly um, those are the two uh, signals from the um, ICs and I just took a snapshot of the signal and what uh, we can see here, for instance, uh, up here, is that uh, there is something being written uh, to the RAM and there is not much activity. And then there is a span where there is uh, writing going on practically all the time and then it's repeating. So, and um, one of those, uh, and uh, well, the, uh, the, the second uh, RAM chip actually does the same thing, but it's all... Um, uh, you know, forwarded uh, for one uh, screen line because this uh, measuring here, 15.7 kilohertz, this is the width uh, of one screen line. So while uh, this RAM chip is being written with uh, some stuff and then doing nothing for a moment, or at least not being written, uh, the other one is being actually, as it looks, written all the time. And then this switches around. This guy is written all the time and this gets some data but then stops uh, writing. Um, so um, what does that mean? Well actually I think, and this is also something that the double drain board did, um, when you uh, look at the, um, at the time span between those uh, two measuring lines, what is going on is that this uh, RAM uh, IC up here is probably outputting its data and after or uh, no not really after but while it is doing that it is actually also clearing its content that it is uh, that's that's the reason why it's writing uh, uh, intermittently it's not a continuous signal as you can see if you uh, go closer but um, it's much uh, rather an alternating signal so it is uh, being read and after being read it is clearing its content so in, in this time span the first uh, RAM is actually uh, read and cleared after reading at the same time while the other RAM chip is being prepared for the next line which is those actions here um, this doesn't require the whole um, time interval for one horizontal line on the screen obviously there's some spare time at the end uh, a RAM can be filled faster uh, then uh, the, li the line uh, uh, needs to be drawn and after that uh, it switches so this RAM has been filled with data so it can be read afterwards and uh, cleared for the next uh, write cycle which is coming after that while the other RAM is being, uh, which has been cleared here, is being prepared for the next line occurring here, and so on and so on. So uh, these signals make perfect sense in the context um, that we have a toggling uh, screen RAM for um, uh, um, for every second line uh, on the screen uh, with the objects. Um, and if we now compare um, those right signals to the RGB output signal that we looked at at the beginning, we should actually be able to say which one of the ICs could be the culprit.
because it would be, be the one uh, where while the reading and erasing is going on the video signal would be you know on maximum level all the time that would be the one that is the culprit so let's just hook uh, up one of the right lines of one of the ICs together with one of the RGB signals okay so this is what it uh, looks like what did I do I hooked up this RAM on the corner here uh, together with the um, blue output signal and what we can see is that uh, the white lines are actually they are synchronized with the right activity in the RAM which is good um, and what we can see is the white lines are occurring at a point in time where the uh, this RAM chip is being written and not read so it should not be it can really not be responsible for this um, high signal at that point so our main suspect should be this guy let's uh, just double check and connect uh, uh, this probe to our suspect okay so this is more like it um, whenever this uh, RAM chip is being read and cleared at the same time the video signal appears to be high uh, which is uh, probably incorrect so this guy should be faulty uh, that's actually a very hot lead I'd say and uh, to confirm that is, uh, this is truly the case um, we could actually uh, hook up the RAM chip to my um, logic analyzer and um, with the logic analyzer we can look at all the address lines, the data lines, the write enable line and uh, we can uh, check what the chip is doing uh, at all times and um, therefore we should be able um, to figure out if uh, the RAM chip is actually working and outputting stuff that is, it has been written to before or if it is uh, working incorrectly So I uh, hooked up the logic analyzer to the RAM chip that always uh, takes a little while fiddling around with all those cables and I already uh, took some uh, signal samples uh, that is what you can see here I have uh, three waveforms here one is um, the address lines of the RAM uh, number two is the data lines of the RAM and uh, third uh, waveform is the uh, write enable signal and um, yeah what we can see here is actually a uh, representative of what is um, happening uh, all of the time uh, we already can uh, see uh, a similarity um, to the waveform that we saw uh, on the oscilloscope when we looked at the signal um, Okay, and when I zoom uh, in uh, on the uh, signals, we can see what is actually going on. Okay, so we can see now the, um, the addresses on top. And actually for each line, um, the, this address counter will uh, start at zero and count up, like you can see here. Uh, 1A8, 1A9, 1AA, 1AB, and so on and so on. And um, when the address is selected, uh, the RAM chip outputs um, the data value, which is in this case FF. And uh, what happens then is there is a write command being issued to the RAM, and um, the RAM is supposed to write 00, zero to this address. So, and uh, this is actually going on uh, all of the time. It, this is counting up. All cells appear to read FF and are then, after being read, are then set to zero. 
this is actually the phase when the RAM chip is used to draw uh, um, the um, line of objects on the screen. Um, so the data is taken from the RAM and the RAM is being set to zero, so just to clear it. Okay, and when um, when this phase is over, so let's see, there's not much act act activity going on here at the end. Yeah, we can see um, right here we are um, in the right here we are in the phase uh, where uh, the RAM chip is being programmed if there's any objects on the screen for this particular line there don't seem to be any uh, objects there because there's no write commands but uh, that doesn't really matter much because what we see is that anyhow the address counter is going up, you can see it here, starting at 2e, 2f, 30, 31, 32, and so on. And the RAM always outputs, um, always outputs a value of ff. No write commands at this time. Um, but, um, well, the output of ff for all of the memory cells is, is probably wrong because uh, as we saw before all of the memory cells have been uh, programmed to be zero zero but um, well the RAM chip actually uh, seemed to have uh, ignored that um, it is staying at FF and um, the next time when programming um, begins or rather uh, reading the RAM and clearing the cells um, again over here, if we zo zoom into that we can see that um, also here every time a new cell is selected it still um, set the RAM chip still sets the data lines to FF so it is FF all the time no matter uh, what has been written, or if it has been, or if the RAM has been cleared, um, the RAM seems to just ignore all the write inputs and uh, stay at uh, FF uh, with the outputs all the time. And uh, that's a typical uh, way of a RAM chip to fail, actually. So I guess this uh, absolutely proves that there's a problem with the uh, RAM chip. The signals that are reaching the RAM chip, uh, RAM chip um, seem to make sense and are plausible actually. So I don't think that it is anything surrounding the RAM chip. But uh, right here you can clearly see uh, that the RAM chip uh, itself is malfunctioning. Um, I'm just taking uh, some more samples just to sh uh, show you. Um, what uh, the uh, waveforms might look if there's uh, something more going on on the screen actually uh, like here let's zoom into that uh, we can see that here in the preparation phase um, for the next line there's actually for this particular line there's something more going on than just uh, uh, reading uh, FF and writing zeros. So here the RAM chip is supposed to be written with, with some different values like 1D, um, which uh, also uh, doesn't actually uh, lead to the result that the value is changed as we can see right here because after uh, the period of uh, writing when the counters go up over here uh, is still always FF, no other values. So it's time I guess to, um, to get this RAM chip out, put a socket in and uh, look for a replacement. Okay, so uh, now I removed the RAM chip in question. Uh, which was this guy over here and I uh, put a socket in. 
and uh, I actually just fired up the game to see what happens and it looks no different without the chip which is actually a good indication of this uh, chip being uh, not much of a helper in this circuit <laughs> so um, I'm afraid I have to um, order a replacement part uh, somewhere on the web but I'll um, try to get it uh, as fast as I can and then uh, we can try out if the board is working again with a new chip okay now it's a couple of days uh, later and I got this in the mail I already uh, turned on the game you can s still see the same problem but uh, well, I hope that uh, with the RAM chip that is hopefully in this package that we can fix a board mm -hmm. okay it looks to be the right one Very good. So we actually fixed the game. So with a really minor part and uh, an overall um, uh, cheap board that we uh, got as not working. I think we uh, got a great uh, result. Okay, so thank you very much for uh, watching. I hope this video, video uh, wasn't too boring uh, overall because it turned it turns out to be pretty uh, pretty lengthy, I guess. But um, I hope, of course, that uh, this uh, video serves uh, as an example that can help you with your own arcade PCB repairs and uh, if you like the video uh, please hit the uh, subscribe button I'll be back with uh, more arcade related repairs uh, hopefully very soon so thanks again and bye bye <laughs>